Boards and booze, booze and boards, drink some beers, fight some hordes, drank too much, forgot our swords, ran back home, filled our gourds, got drunk again, sang some chords, boards and booze, booze and boards, with Mickey and Jeb. Well, Mickey, we just got back from uh, PAX Unplugged, and I know you didn't buy any games there, so there must be some some random game sitting around here that you want to play. You're a funny man. You're a <laughs> funny man. So if you watched the PAX video, and you watched the very last game that we reviewed, um, then you know what is coming, because I was super, super pumped about this game after after acquiring it at PAX, and without anything stupid other than Jeb's intro commentary, <laughs> we have, today we have, we have Dice Throne. Um, Look at that beautiful art. Yep, this is definitely art that sucked Mickey in. This is uh, Dice Throne, and it is, I'm trying to read, upside, upside down. down. Two to six players, eight to adult, uh, 20, 20 to 40, 40 minutes. minutes, and it is... Oh, it's on the side here. It no, is it's right here. Is. MBG LC LLC. I don't um, know. Um, I forget. But it's mind bottling, bo bottling, bottling, games. bottling game. Oh, that's right. Um, and I know they were purchased by. They made. They got a, a deal with Roxley. Um, oh, the games that they do are right on the top of my tongue, but I can't. I, what? Yeah. Really, yeah. Whatever. Uh, so. Punk rally. Yeah. There's one. <laughs> okay. And then. Um, by Nate uh, Chatelier and Manny Tremley. And it says, select your champion, command your dice, take the throne. So. If you can't tell, Mickey's excited. Mickey's excited. He <laughs> likes this one. So, uh, a anyways. Um, it's uh, one one versus one or two versus two, or you might be able to do three versus three. Yeah, right? two to six. Yeah. Um, yeah you got to alter the rules a little bit when you um, play with multiple people. Uh, not a lot, just like, it's just... Yeah, you, small you, stuff. Because it's, you know, you're battling, so you got to make sure that it's um, it's evened out um, for, for how you do damage and things like that. Uh, anyways, uh, pick this up at PAX. Um, it is a basically a dice chucker um, that you're doing battling with. And uh, I guess we'll get into more details in a minute, but we're gonna. So we're just gonna jump into components because can't wait to show you those either. <laughs> and Jeb thinks I'm absolutely hilarious because I'm so excited for it. Um, but you know, part of it is because uh, you know when I saw it, and and you know, like I said, the the art really does like. A lot of times on a game, it's a, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the art for me is a big deal. I miss good games sometimes just because they don't they don't they don't grab me and then somebody makes me sit down and play it and I'm like oh well, that's a really good game and it's not something I would have normally um, gravitated to uh, so this one I kept looking at and then to make matters worse I, I'm like everybody is walking around with that's no lie they, they were every time you it or they were sitting they at the were table sitting playing, and playing it. it and you couldn't get in on a demo. Um, and finally, I got to the to, to the the, ta the their t table um, and and waited until I got one of the reps. Uh, who knows? Could have been a creator. I don't know if they were there. I'm assuming they were there. Um, and they described the whole thing, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds cool. I'm in." Um, so, uh, without um, too too much more, we're just going to break into the components. Yep. Um, and, and it, it, it's going to be a one versus one, me versus yep. Mickey, right? Throwing down to see who gets that thrown. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, at PAX we played it twice, and Mickey won one, and I won one. Yeah. So this is the the oh, decider. this is a tie tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that means we have to both play New a character people. that we haven't yeah. we haven't played. Um. So so anyways. Uh, that was a really long introduction, so yeah. let's just get to the components because I think you guys will be pleasantly surprised there too. Okay, we're here for components for Dice Throne. Let's just get right into it, man. All right, let's so, do it. First thing, there are six different heroes in Dice Throne. Uh, I think some might be from Kickstarter, but anyway, the version we have has six heroes. Yeah. And each hero comes with 
pretty much the same kind of components. So the first thing is the hero board. And as you can see, that's what a hero board looks like. All right. Uh, okay. So, so like Jeb said, there's six of these. Uh, just to show off what you what what these the, I mean these guys hit us a home run because check that out. Yeah. <laughs> Full art on the back. I mean for no other reason just because it's cool. I, it's just just phenomenal. So that's uh, so there you got a moon elf. Uh, your other characters are barbarian. I'm just gonna go around real quick. Paladin, a monk, a pyromancer. And a shadow thief, and again, yeah, as you can full see, art on the, back. on the back. Just so cool. It's really, it's really awesome. Okay. All right. And with the hero board, there is a hero leaflet that comes with each hero. So basically, when you're setting up, you grab your hero board, you grab its leaflet. So this, so uh, instead of trying to squish a whole bunch of information on the main board. They get you a little sideboard that gives you a nice description of any of your character's special abilities. And uh, there's also the different sides of the die. Right, so you know what your odds are of, of, of getting things when you roll dice, which we'll get into more when we go over gameplay. But that is a typical setup for your, um, your board and your, your leaflet. Also, the heroes come with uh, some other components that... Mickey is going to pull out one of the, the right. very handy... Uh, well, I'm going to show you this first before Jeb gets into it. Okay. Another Grand Slam out of the park. Look at the inserts on this thing. Look at it. Oh, all the character in one, one thing that you just pull out and you're ready to go. Just And it's not too squishy. Fits perfectly. I've had this thing on its side. Nothing fell out. It's a great job. Alright, so we have Moon Elf. So I'm going to pull out the components for Moon Elf, and then Jeb will yep. talk so about So, first those. thing you... is the CP dial. Alright, so, uh, CP stands for combat points, and it's a nice dial, and it just spins around. It's really well made. Got Good. the picture of your yep. character on it? picture of the character, so again, with the full art. Oh, and um, what was the good thing about this And dial? the good thing is, it's not like Fantasy Flight. You don't have to kill your fingers to squish it together. I was so happy. It just, they're already made. You don't have to do anything. So, so good. All right, next up is the health dial, which... Same thing, um, except it's, you know, double-sided because you could have various amounts of points. Oh, I like how the uh, the artwork on yep. it is a different facing direction. Yeah, different different artwork, but still still uh, covers the whole thing, so very, very cool looking. Uh, you've got the character-specific dice. And there are your five dice. For They're all different colored, obviously. Uh, they're well made. The pictures and numbers are very clear. So... They should last a long, a long time. Uh, next up are the hero cards. Everybody has a unique set of cards. All the backs are different, again, with the art, again, just so cool. And so, if for some reason you got them messed up, you'd be fine. The face of the cards are, uh, they're just, they're, they're plain, but they're very bold. They're very easy, yeah. very easy to read. Which makes it nice too. You're not, and you don't want yeah, pictures you, and stuff on that. No, nope. um, and they did just a real good job of keeping everything simple and clean and clear. And then Mickey pulled it off to the side, but there's a turn order card for yep. everybody. So a little cheat sheet. Everybody, it comes and everybody gets one. And then the last thing are the uh, hero tokens. Yep. So, and and each hero is it has their own. Uh, tokens now some some could overlap and have you know ha ha be able to do the same effect just you know a nature of having an effect um, but every hero at least has one or two probably more sp unique effects to them so that makes it really cool and, and go ahead uh, when you uh, when you open the box uh, in the rule book, it actually lists the specific tokens for each hero. Yeah, that was really and nice knowing yeah, where they went. So knowing you the know, count and everything. Yep, how many go to each particular one. Um, and again, with the inserts, the it's hollowed out at the bottom. 
so these all fit nicely they don't bump up the cards and like Jeb just said since you know exactly how many each different character of what token they're supposed to have you just plop it in there plop the cards back plop the dice in there the two the cheat sheet your two dials wow that was quick clean up thank you <laughs> I did a good job and then uh, an another thing is on the side of the leaflet it also has pictures of the different tokens yeah which that they token use. represents so what when, it is so when you actually finish a game you could just actually look at that and pull your tokens out of if they got mixed up with your phone. Some of these, yeah, yeah, because because you will give, depending on the status condition, you will give that token to your opponent to remind them that they're under whatever that effect is. Right. Um, so that's a good point, Jeb, that you have, you know that you're, hey, I'm supposed to have these ones, not you. Um, so that is it for components. Other than the rule book, I can show you that real quick. It's It's a thin one. I won't show it to you upside down, that's stupid. Um, but it's really quick, and as you can see, the majority of it is actually like pictures and stuff. So uh, you're not talking about anything complicated here. And I believe that's everything for components. That is everything for components. So in just a second, we will be back with Set uh, setup, and then we will go over gameplay, and then as normal, we will battle. Yep. All right, so we're going to show you how to set up the game. It's super simple. Like, yeah, we, we almost could have just, just yeah, done this while through. we were talking about it. But there are a couple steps that yeah. aren't, like, you know, aren't component. I mean, you use the components, but they're not the components. So, anyways. Yeah. So the first thing you're going to do is both players are going to select a hero. Right. And when you select your hero, you're going to collect your board, your leaflet, and then the dials that are associated with them. I centered that again. Yeah. Alright, and then there's your dials. And the tokens, and the dice, and the deck. So okay. pretty much everything that was in that handy little yeah. plastic holder. Right. Um, you can dump these out or keep it to the side. I When I, I played, I kind of just kept my thing out. It just kind of depends on how much room you have. Yep. All right. So next up, both players are going to shuffle their decks, and they each draw four cards. So that's not difficult to do. Yep. I didn't mention during components, these cards are very nice. They're the linen, or at least they look like it and feel like it. Um, and I can see the, the little lines that they usually look like. So anyways, uh, they're very nice. And then uh, I'd probably keep this down here somewhere, not up top, yeah. but just so you guys can see. And I draw a hand of four. Yep, so would your opponent. Oh, well, look what I got, guys. <laughs> All right. It means nothing, right? Next up, uh, both players are going to set their dials to the correct number. And since it's, uh, I think in the, the rule book they have a, like a learning uh, Yeah, they thing. start you at 30 instead of 50 health. Yeah, but um, in actually, an actual game. Jeb and I, didn't, we didn't do any of the learning stuff. If you have any gaming under your belt, you really don't need to, to do the learning stuff. Right. But to tell you the honest truth, uh, because it, it unless you've never, you know, played, almost ever played a game before, because what they do in the learning one is they set your health down lower and they tell you not to use any of the status effects or the cards. Which I think, is like one of the... Oh, no, I, maybe they don't take the status effects. But I know that you yeah, don't no use cards. the cards. And I'm like... Well, that's the whole game. It's not a bad idea for like for learning. Yeah, yeah for but... for learning. Uh, we chose to just jump right in and had zero problems just jumping right in. And you could also jump in and be like, "Wait, I don't quite understand," and then just you know back back yeah. it out and uh, play the other way. So there's, there's your fifty health. Fifty health and two CP. Two CP. Right. Um, so your CP is actually basically your currency in this game. All right, so both players will do that, and then the first player is determined by rolling the die. So, Mickey, you grab one of your die, and I'll just grab a random die. I got uh, a four, he got a one, Jeb, so Jeb, I'll go first. Jeb would get to go first in this case. All right, and then the thing is, the first player skips the income phase on their first turn. So, right. once, once 
that that's pretty much uh, yeah. It's just the up. first. <laughs> it's the first player penalty to keep try to keep the game balanced and somebody not coming out of the the gate swinging harder than um, the other person. So uh, and it, and it seemed to work fine. Yep. And at this point, everything is done for setup, and you can begin playing. Okay, we are back, and we are going to go over the uh, gameplay slash mechanics of the game. Which probably won't take very long it's pretty pretty straightforward um, so if you've ever if you've ever played Yahtzee before you'll you'll kind of get the gist of this so anyways what do we got first up Jim okay so we're gonna go over turn order so the first thing that happens on your turn is the upkeep phase and in that phase all you do is apply status effects so if you're like poisoned or burned or whatever different effects go off in that phase you apply them. It's a pretty standard thing. Then is the income phase. And what do you get in the income phase, Mickey? Okay, so in the income phase, with the exception of the first player on their first turn, you gain one championship point, or one combat point, sorry. Uh, and so you just turn your dial from wherever it is up one, uh, nothing to the health dial, and you draw a card for it into your hand. So you just take it right off the top of your deck, put it in your hand, you're good to go. All right, and that, that's all for the income phase. So the next phase is the main phase one. This is uh, where you can play abilities, and you can play any cards that are ability upgrades. Basically, that's um, upgrading the spots on here. Sorry. And you can play any action cards in your hand that right. can go off in the main phase. Right, and... Uh, the last thing you can do is sell cards, mm -hmm. and what that is is you discard a card to gain one combat, combat point. point. Yep. So what that means, if I have a hand of cards here, I can literally just discard any card that I want, maybe something I think is, is uh, not as useful, and I can turn my dial up on the combat points uh, one time. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that um, on, on the various cards, the cost of them is actually different amounts in, in combat points, because that's how you pay for your cards. They have no effect when it comes to selling. Every card in your deck is worth one combat point if you decide to sell it. And there is also no limit on the number of cards that you can sell. Right. Okay, so since during the main phase is the, you're mm, pretty much, for the most part, it's, it's where you're going to um, start being able to play cards from your hand. So we're going to go over the different cards that you can play during the game. So let's start with a major one during the main phase, which would be a main phase action card. Okay, so here's an example of a main phase action card. Literally says main phase action on the card. So in order to be able to play this card, it has to be the main phase. If you roll if you move to the next phase during the roll phase and you were like, oops, should have played that, too late. So that's a uh, example of one card. Other cards that are pretty standard during the main phase would be any of your upgrade cards. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, you can a lot of these spaces on your character board are upgradable. This is the Paladin, so he actually has an upgrade for his passive ability. So I could play this card, or I could spend, as you can see here, three combat points. I would just reduce my dial by the three down to zero in this case because I only had three on there and then this would override that space and I would have um, these abilities to use. There are here's an upgrade for one of his combat moves and that one actually costs two combat points and here's an example of an upgrade for his defense. Okay. And all of these upgrades actually they, they're just better versions of the card or the abilities right. that you're covering up. Ex so it's not like you're really losing. Yes, exactly. Also, an important note is remember I said that it costs combat points to uh, upgrade the spaces on the board. Okay, so again, like I was saying, you pay the combat points for these. Now, if, uh, if you notice, the ones that I put out on the board right now, they they all are a level 2. So, you know, you started with a level 1 and then you upgraded to level 2. However, there are level 3s in the game. 
Notice that th in this example, the level three is four combat points. So there are two ways that I could put the divine defense into play. If this wasn't here, I could literally skip the level two, spend the four combat points, and it's in play. However, if maybe I did I didn't get this card until much later and I wanted to and this was already in play, I don't have to at this point I don't have to pay four combat points. I only have to pay the difference between what's already out there. So this is three combat points, this is four combat points. So in order to get this card into play, I would only have to pay one. And then I could I would well I wouldn't take that off. I would just put that right on top like that. So there is a there is a um a nice mechanic there in terms of, you know, you, you don't really get screwed over with uh, trying to upgrade to the level 3 abilities on your character board. The other thing that you can do, and this is any time, is what's called an incident. They're red. Some of them have a cost, so you'd pay the cost, and then you could do this any time you wanted. You can just, like... Any phase. Right. Any phase you want, you just do what the card says and then discard it. Um, instants are a really good way to mess with your opponent. There are a lot of cards that um, will will let you do that, and some of them are instants. The next so, phase is the offensive roll phase, and there's actually three roll phases. Yep. But the first of the three is the offensive roll phase. So, okay. so what that means is the first step in that is the person who is the offensive player is going to take all their die and they are just going to roll them okay and then they're going to either match numbers or symbols however they want to do that I like to look at the symbols first and then take a look at what I have uh, okay so uh, Right now, I actually have a small straight, as you can see. One, two, three, four. Uh, I also have a pair of swords and a pair of the helmets and one of the praying hands. So what I would do at this point is look around my board and try to decide on what I, you know, I'm hoping to do. The Ultimate ability is always all sixes. In that case, it would be the praying hands. This one, for instance, has three swords and two of the helmets. Mm, I'm almost there. Uh, so, you know, maybe I can get there. So I have a total of two more re-rolls if I want them. So I'm going to pick up this die and roll it. And I got the sword. And look at that. So now I have three swords and the two helmets, and if I choose to do so at this point, I can choose my righteous combat, and then I can do whatever it says on that space of my character board. However, uh, there are roll phase action cards that you can play to help manipulate your dice, mess with your opponent, whatever. If it says roll phase action, it can be done on any of the phases. And if any you of the roll phases. any of the roll phases, and it doesn't matter. It's kind of like an instant in terms of if you know if this if this card happened to say change the face of a die, and it was uh, and and say and say Jeb had this card, and he was like, no, I don't want that to go off, and he could be like, I'm playing this right now. Pay for it. Change one of my die. Um, that's kind of the point of the roll phase ones to manipulate the die or let you re-roll or, or various other effects. But rem the important thing to remember, like Jeb just said, was that these cards are, if it says roll phase, any of the phases. If they specifically want it to be one of the different roll phases, it will say defensive roll phase right. or it'll say offensive roll phase but if it just says roll phase then any of them goes and the important thing about the offensive roll phase like mickey said you get two re-rolls after your first roll and then when you're selecting an attack to do you can only uh, select one so if your dice can cover multiple it doesn't matter you can only pick one attack to do right so in this case 
let's I already hit an attack um, I, I would I would not take my last roll because I don't want to risk anything uh, so then I would work from top to bottom and do as much as this is happens and this one says deal five damage and roll two dice and then it would add one damage per helmet and two damage per, per sword so I would have a base of five and then whatever I rolled on those two dice I would gain that much more and then I would gain uh, two times the number of hearts in health so it's covering also if I roll hearts and I would gain um, a combat point if I rolled the praying hands. So this particular attack gives me something on those two dice that I roll every single time. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, plus the base damage of five. They all have different abilities. We're not gonna we're not gonna read you everybody on the paladin. We're just trying to let you know how it works. However, if I didn't get what I wanted here, I could be like, mm, I'm gonna you know re-roll that last time. Jeb had mentioned also in, in when we were describing the components, you'll notice down here you have a chart, so you kind of know the odds of, on the dice of what you could get. So two sides have swords, two sides have helmets, one side has the life, and one side has the prayer. It also tells you what the matching numbers on that. So if I look at this die, if I go to the one, look, it's a sword. If I go to the to look it's a sword so they it, they did that's really nice when you're trying to figure out what you might want to do and when you choose an attack there's actually a phase called the targeting roll phase and that only comes into play when there's multiple or more than two players so if Mickey chose to do the righteous combat and he was playing against two other people he would choose before he resolves the attack right okay and then after you resolve the attack a, you go into the de defensive roll phase, and what happens there is if damage is dealt from your attack, the receiver can activate their defense ability. Okay, so, so just to clarify a little bit on what Jeb just said there, so if damage is dealt, what, why they word it like that is there are abilities in the game that stop damage from actually happening, so... And there are abilities on the defensive rolls that give kind of bonuses. Like, yeah. um, so what they're trying to do there is you don't automatically get a defensive roll if somebody attacks and nothing happens to you. Right. Because that would be, a, it, it could cause a little bit of brokenness in the game because there, like I said, there are, like this, this defensive roll actually does damage back. Um, some of them gain health or whatever. So unless damage is actually being dealt, you don't do the defensive roll. In this case, let's say uh, Jeb had no um, no abilities that stopped the damage from going through, and I did indeed deal the five damage. Let's say I just gained health or something like that. So he would take the five dice, or I'm sorry, not the five dice, uh, he's going to use the example of the Barbarian there. Yep, uh, it says defensive roll three dice, heal two times the number of hearts. So okay. I'm taking the three Barbarian die. Right. No, look at that. No hearts. So he literally got nothing. Now, a couple keys to remember here. First, remember that you got to look at your defensive card to see how many dice you get to roll. This is not an automatic five dice. Right. Okay? The other thing to remember is, look, if you notice, we just went, oh, I missed. There are no re-rolls on your defense. Unless you have a card that lets you re-roll something, the defense is just straight up whatever you roll. Yep. After you roll the defensive die, uh, players have a final chance to use cards and effects to manipulate everything. And then once everybody's done the offensive and defensive damage are dealt simultaneously. Right. So, at that point, um, so like in this case, Jeb rolled, he wasn't able to block anything or gain any health or whatever, so the five damage would go through. He would take his combat dial and adjust it down by five damage, and then it would move into the second main phase of the game. Yep. Uh, second main phase of the game is basically, oh, I can do more stuff like I did in the first 
main phase of the game. Why would that be important? Well, I could have gained some things during combat yeah. that I, maybe I got some more combat points back. I have another card in my hand that maybe I can upgrade a spot. Maybe I can upgrade my defense for coming into Jeb's turn. Yep. I don't know. There's a lot of things... You could just be strategically holding on to something just because, like, oh, if I don't need this, this is going to be really good on Jeb's turn or whatever. Um, so that's the point of the second main phase. There's, there's no, there is literally nothing different than what you are able to do in the first main phase. It's just one more opportunity to play cards that you might have uh, been saving and uh, let you get them out maybe a little earlier or for um, tactical purposes. And then once you're done with main phase two, you enter the discard phase. And what happens there is you must sell cards until you have six or fewer in your hand. Yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, pretty easy. It's, if, you, if you've got more than six, which I don't even know, did we ever even come close to that? Um, we've only played a few times, so I don't know if you know there's some good strategy on letting your hand build up or not from what we saw it's pretty fast paced and you kind of want to come out doing stuff but it's not to say that it, it it that one of these characters doesn't play better by you know having a lot of options in your hand and letting your combat points build up a little bit you know maybe the you know kind of like the rope a dope um strategy i don't know uh, like i said we don't we don't know all the characters inside now but Certainly the option is there to do things like that. However, you need to remember maximum of six. All right. And then there are a few game concepts that uh, we should go over real quick. The ultimate ability, as Mickey said, it's when you roll all sixes. Uh, what's special about the ultimate ability is that when it's, say, Mickey rolled all sixes, I'm able to alter the dice to prevent it from happening. But once it happens, there's nothing that can stop the damage or prevent stuff from happening from that ultimate ability. That's right. So uh, that's one of the things that makes the ultimate ability so cool. Um, that, like Jeb said, unless you have cards to manipulate that person's die, once the resolution phase for that, for whatever the, whoever's ultimate ability is going off, if it resolves... There is nothing that can stop it. Now, I will say that I had I had one question a little bit with the way that the rules were written when it came to the thief, because the thief has an ability called shadows, where basically he goes into shadows, and any damage coming in from an attack doesn't hit him. I, I found the rule book wording on how the, ult, the ultimate attack worked a, a little... Um, I felt like the intent was there, but really the way that it was worded was kind of like you just can't do any actions while the resolving of that attack is going off. Well, in my mind, if you're in shadows, you're not spending anything, you're not doing anything, you're just already in shadows. Um, and I just go over this because I, I have a feeling other gamers might have asked, asked yeah. this question. I'm, I'm really nitpicking right now, um, but... At the end of the day, it it doesn't prevent an ultimate attack from happening. There is nothing that prevents that except the manipulation of the dice, which we've already said like three times. So, that's it. Well, um, there is one more thing. Uh, one more thing that stops it? No, not oh. stopping it. You're able to enhance the effects of your ultimate ability. So, if you increase the amount of damage it does, you're able to do that. But you, there's nothing that can reduce the damage or prevent it. Oh, okay, I see what so. you mean. I thought you meant there was something that could, oh, could no, stop no. it. No, no. <laughs> the next thing I have is with the different effects, uh, you can actually just read the card and see, just do what it says for each of the effects. But the thing to keep in mind is that right here, for each of the effects in the white strip or whatever, there is a stack limit. Right. Or it will say, does not stack. Yeah. And the thing with stack limit is, it is the maximum amount of tokens of that type that can be on a hero. Right. So, um, unfortunately, the Paladin doesn't have any of that stack, but, uh, like, say the, the Monk has Chi, I think they call it. They call it Chi in this game? Uh, yes, I believe so. Here's the Shadow Thief. He has a stack limit of three on poison. Okay, so... 
So basically that means that he can only have three poison tokens operating at any particular point in time. On a hero. Right. So that's, I, I mean, stack just means maximum. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yep. that's really what it comes what it comes down to. Um, first time we played, just just in case this question comes up for somebody else, uh, in, in terms of the, the stack limit, uh, and I'll use the monk for example, has a stack limit of, I think it was five, four or five on his cheat. And there is a card in his deck that says that his stack limit increases. Yep. So the question was, oh, is that just for the turn or is that forever? We thought it was forever. We were right. It is forever. But then we were wondering, well, how do you remember that? You guys are probably like, well, I know how to do that. Well, we were it's having the rules. Yeah, right? <laughs> we were having we were having a brain fart because we didn't like thoroughly read the rules, and it was like, just have a little pool, and then you know how many you have access to. And we were like, duh, that's what you should do. So, in case that question comes up, that's how you keep track of your stack limit. Have have something to the side of what your limits are, and then um, only put them into play when they're in play. And then if you have something that actually increases the stack limit, well, put a new token into your pool. So one last thing is for winning the game, it's just you defeat, get your opponent down to zero. zero. Yep. Uh, there is a small possibility that both players can get defeated simultaneously. And if that happens, the rulebook says that it ends in a draw. So I think that's everything for how to play. And all you have to do is watch the first few minutes of our, our gameplay, if you don't want to watch it all, yeah. uh, to get a feel for the game. So. Yeah, honestly, um, everything is really, really, for the most part, pretty self-explanatory. So if you understand the rolling system, or if you've ever played Yahtzee, you, you really will understand the game, because uh, there's not a lot of confusing wording or anything. So, I mean, every turn, roll your five dice, you've got two more rolls, to match whatever you're trying to go for, um, and uh, hopefully you can get there. And then it's just uh, go back and forth until somebody gets to zero. Yep. Okay, so we will set up a one-versus-one player game of Dice Storm. All right.